Good evening, guys. So we are all welcome to uh, this second webinar uh, being organized by Ghana Medical Club uh, and Ghana Health Services, as well as the Canadian uh, Biomedical Society. Uh, we'll start just in a few uh, minutes, just to let you know that uh, healthcare delivery is core Improving healthcare delivery is core to GMH, and for over 10 years of existence in the rural uh, communities in Ghana, the two northmost regions in Ghana, the Upper West and the Upper East regions, we've, over the period of time, helped improve the health system there by partnering with all district hospitals in those areas and helping them with very basic medical items to improve healthcare delivery. Over the period of time, we realized that sustainability is key and as such, training uh, local, local hospital-based uh, people to support in the upkeep of uh, the equipment, what we call our ambassadors, as well as engineers who are on site to help in the repairs of this, this equipment that we donate as well as all other equipment that are donated by other organizations as well as those that are procured by the hospitals. Uh, we've, over the past three years, uh, been having such trainings. This year, unfortunately, due to the COVID outbreak, we could not have it uh, physically. And uh, just like those of us who probably joined us for the first uh, webinar, as we were told, we uh, started this online training program uh, involving uh, local expertise here in Ghana, Mr. John Ziena at the headquarters of the Ghana Health Service, as well as international experts, Dr. Bill Gentles and Martin. Uh, they will be leading us through uh, this training uh, webinar for the clinical engineers. Kindly be reminded to mute your microphone. Should you have any question, kindly put it up uh, in the chat box and then you'll be attended to. Uh, we are all welcome to today's uh, presentation and I would. Uh, give uh, the space to Mr. John Ziena, who I can see has logged in uh, to uh, welcome all the engineers and then we, we kickstart. So I'm, I'm excited to join. I hope everyone is excited and I'm, I know we'll learn a lot uh, from this. Thank you. Okay, John, John Ziena is connected, but he's not um, coming through in audio. So um, my name is Bill Gentles. I'm chair of the International Outreach Committee of the Canadian Medical and Biological Engineering Society and um, been working with Ghana Medical Help for several years now. And great pleasure to uh, join you in participating in this webinar. Um, I'll just hand it over to um, Martin Poulin to introduce himself and then we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Martin Poulin. I'm uh, the director of clinical engineering in on the west coast of Canada, out of Victoria, British Columbia. So today we're going to describe how to set up an ideal clinical engineering workshop for a, a, a larger acute care hospital in your area. Okay. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the uh, ideal amount of space and the ideal location of the workshop. Then we're going to talk uh, a little about, about the recommended way to lay out the workshop. And we're going to speak to uh, the power and furniture requirements uh, for the workshop. We'll speak to some of the recommended tools uh, required and how to secure storage of those tools. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the recommended spare parts that you may need for your site. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about how to argue for needed space and tools that you may require with administration. So first of all, what is the, um, an ideal size and location of the workshop? So first of all, the ideal location is to be as close as possible to your primary customers. And one of the primary customers being the operating theater where 
a lot of the equipment is located. If you're close to your customer, then you can respond quite quickly to problems. And also the equipment doesn't have to transfer very far to get to your workshop to be worked on, which helps to uh, ensure the equipment isn't damaged in transit. If that location is not possible, then the next recommendation would be to ensure the workshop is at least on the hospital site and ideally within the main hospital walls. And that's to ensure that you, you don't have to transfer equipment outside of the building or very far um, because of the risk of equipment being rolled over rough surfaces may cause it to be damaged. And of course, exposure to the weather may also be a problem. So in terms of size, um, the ideal recommended size is about 10 square meters per clinical engineer or technologist. And that area would encompass uh, a workbench and an open space for you to work on larger equipment and on the workbench uh, an area to put your tools and work on smaller equipment. Additionally, if there is an, there would be an additional 10 square meters uh, to work on large equipment like beds or trolleys or exam lights uh, in addition to uh, the electronic area. Also recommended is about 10 square meters for the storage of parts, for the storage of equipment that's waiting repairs, for uh, marshalling or the, the area for shipping and receiving of, of supplies. Uh, what you're seeing here is you know, a shelf with some medical technology awaiting repairs, and also uh, a part storage area in one of our larger Canadian hospitals, just, just as examples. It's also ideal to have um, roughly 10 square meters uh, for the mechanical area where you may have a, a drill press or a grinder or a welding machine and it, it becomes a, a, a separate area which is more of a dirty uh, area for working on equipment. Also recommended um, for the larger hospitals and it is an administrative area and within that area would be um, a place to store your inventory information, your service information, your service manuals, uh, financial information. Um, it also may be the area where the supervisor, if you have one, is located. Uh, it may be an area where you have a, a central computer uh, for staff to, to work on uh, and of course it, it, it's helpful. So um, this is just an example of a front administrative area in one of our larger hospitals in, in BC. Next slide. So um, what is a recommended layout for a workshop? Well, the first thing is ideally to have the shipping receiving area close to the entrance. Um, simply for efficiency. So the equipment coming in can be received and, uh, so, and supplies can be received easily and equipment that's been repaired can be uh, stored there prior to being shipped out. Uh, the second thing is to have an open area where the technologists or clinical engineers are working uh, with a workbench around the walls as describing before, and that allows an area for larger equipment to be worked on. Also having an administrative area adjacent to this open space is ideal, again, in terms of efficiency, if you have to go back and forth from to get manuals or documentation. Having a sink uh, is essential for hand washing and cleaning of equipment, both to keep yourself safe and to keep uh, your patients and staff safe because you want to ensure the equipment is, equipment is clean uh, prior to going back to uh, the, your customers. 
And ideally, if you have a locker room and a toilet uh, in the area as well, it allows you to change into uh, a cleaner uh, uniform or clothes uh, to work on equipment. So this may be hard for some of you to see, but this is from the World Health Organization guidance on clinical engineering workshops. And you'll see in the um, top right is kind of the electronic workshop area for the technologists and clinical engineers with a workbench around the walls. And it has a storage cabinet for tools. And then the bottom right, there is a mechanical uh, workshop um, with a drill, grinder, welding module. Uh, typically, if you're working on beds, there would not be a workbench in the middle of the shop because you would need space. Uh, and then um, there is a locker room on the bottom left uh, with a changing room and a toilet, which is uh, wonderful. And then above that is a storeroom that can be used for part storage, for equipment awaiting repair, uh, and simply could be used as your shipping receiving area. And then the top left, you'll see the administrative area where there's, in this case, is defined as the supervisor's area, but it's a location to put your paper, documentation, manuals, inventory information, service information. And I think I'm turning it over to Bill now. Yeah, thanks, Martin. So I'll do the next few slides. A um, couple of other requirements that you uh, should ideally have in a clinical engineering workshop is um, a good distribution of, uh, of electrical outlets um, on the wall above the workbench uh, so that you can plug in test equipment as well as equipment under test and um, uh, without having to run extension cords across the floor or whatever. And ideally, if you're working on ventilators or anesthetic machines, um, ideally you would have access to an oxygen and a medical air supply if there is piped oxygen uh, and piped medical air in, in the hospital facility. So the workbench, um, typical height of a workbench is approximately one meter high, 0.75 meters deep and 1.8 meters long for, for each um, engineer or technician. And above the workbenches, as you can see in this illustration, um, shelves for parts and service information. And um, just some furniture requirements we'll talk about briefly, obviously an office style desk and chair for administration and computer work, which would be separate from the workshop in an ideal situation where you have sufficient space. But this obviously could be uh, part of a smaller workshop um, just in a, a single room if necessary. Um, you need connections for a computer network and phone. If there's a computer network in the facility, uh, obviously telephones are a necessity. And, um, Secure storage for tools, and we'll talk a bit more about tools in a, a later section of the webinar, but um, tools are valuable items essential for you to do your job effectively, and um, tools tend to walk if they're not secured storely. So, uh, stored securely, I mean. So, again, secure storage for those is um, an essential item. Now, I'm going to hand the next section, recommended tools, over to John Ziena, although I see he's having a bit of trouble logging in. Uh, John, are you there? Right now he's not. So I'll start this section and hopefully John can join us uh, before we get too far. So we um, took a poll of, of a small number of clinical engineers uh, in the Ghana Health Service in the Northern Districts. And um, so some of the higher priority tools here are um, their recommendations. Um, one of those is an ox a handheld oxygen analyzer as illustrated here, useful for testing uh, oxygen concentrators as well as anesthesia machines and ventilators, uh, an essential device. Um, a number of other useful tools we'll talk about a 
handheld air vacuum blower for blowing out dust, digital multimeter, a digital tachometer, non-contact device so you can shine a, a laser beam on a, on a centrifuge and get the uh, rate of revolution. A soldering iron with stand with some solder, toolbox with assorted hand tools such as wrenches, screwdrivers, a utility knife, hammers, etc. as illustrated in the picture at the bottom of this slide. Some um, other test equipment that may be useful but not necessarily essential would be an electronic soldering station with uh, temperature control and temperature display. Uh, this is a popular and expensive one that we've illustrated here in this slide. Uh, a common uh, equipment that you may find yourself working on is refrigeration, air conditioning, cold chain equipment. So a toolkit that allows you to service refrigeration equipment would include uh, an acetylene welding set and set of gauges and replacement gases um, as illustrated here. And this is um, essential if you're gonna work on cold chain equipment. If you're working on mechanical ventilators, a test lung is an essential piece of test equipment. What illustrated here is a um, water quality tester for testing distilled water and used in the labs. Also, um, it, it tests um, electrical conductivity. It can be also used to uh, test um, the output of reverse osmosis water treatment systems used in dialysis. Another extremely useful tool for battery operated equipment is a battery condition analyzer. Uh, battery operated equipment the most unreliable component in any battery operated device is the battery. So it's extremely useful to have something that allows you to test batteries and decide when they need to be replaced. Another tool that was suggested uh, by the biomedical engineers in Ghana, the clinical engineers was an integrated circuit tester, useful if you're doing component level repair of uh, circuit boards. Um, and then a few more items just that may be useful in, in the larger workshops, a signal generator for um, testing circuits, an oscilloscope allowing you to analyze signals within a circuit, and an electrical safety tester to allow you to measure the leakage currents in, in the power cord of a device or in the patient leads of a device to verify it's safe to use on a patient. These are all um, extremely useful tools and commonly found in Canadian clinical engineering departments and we recommend them for the larger clinical engineering departments in Ghana. Moving along, um, secure storage of tools. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, tools are valuable and essential to you for you to be able to perform your work effectively. You don't want them disappearing. Uh, you need to be able to lock them up when you go home for the night. Um, there are a number of options in doing this, either a steel cabinet, uh, a machinist's tool cabinet, like with the one illustrated on the right, or um, a metal or wood storage boxes, box that has a lock on it that you can close up and um, put a lock on for the night. So those are just a couple of options in uh, secure storage of tools. Now we're going to talk briefly about um, managing spare parts because as we mentioned before the um, the need for spare parts is essential and you need to also monitor and control your stock of spare parts and maintenance materials to ensure that you always have the required items in stock on the shelves when you need them. If you're, if a device, a medical device breaks down and needs repair and you have to wait until it's broken before you order the repair part, the downtime of that medical device will be much longer than if you have uh, repair parts on the shelf for the most common fa failures in medical devices. And, and this has a direct impact on the quality of patient care. Uh, if device is unusable because you're waiting for parts, 
uh, it has a, a serious impact on the quality of patient care. So it's strongly advisable to persuade your hospital administrator to give you the budget or the funds to stock some of the most commonly used spare parts in advance of their requirement for doing repairs. So in the next slide, I'll just talk about how to um, do some calculations to estimate how many parts you're gonna need and of which type of parts. So the, the rate of use of each part is affected obviously by the likely breakdown rate or the life of a part estimated from your past experience and your records. Talking about records, it's ideal if you're keeping um, written or computerized records of all repair work and maintenance work done on the medical equipment that you're responsible for. Because this allows you to develop a history of what, which parts you're using most frequently and how often they're required so that you can predict your rate of usage and establish a budget for parts at the beginning of each year. And I'll just illustrate this with a simple example. Let's, let's talk about a vital signs monitor. Uh, this is something that Ghana Medical Health has provided to a number of hospitals in Northern Ghana. The vital signs monitor uses with inside a six volt, 4.5 amp hour um, sealed lead acid batteries, to, similar to the one illustrated on the right. Now experience, I'm talking here about experience in Canada because I'm, your experience in Canada may vary, but this is just an illustration. Our experience shows that these batteries typically last on an average about two years. Now, some of them only last six months, some of them last three years, but on average, they seem to be lasting about two years in the Canadian environment. That'll be different in Ghana. And you need to be able to measure that so that you can project your need for replacement batteries. Let's say you have four of these vital signs monitors in your hospital. And you know that the average lifetime of the battery used in that monitor is two years. Therefore, every two years, you're gonna to need to replace four batteries. So the average rate of replacement is two batteries per year or four batteries every two years. This gives you an estimate of the budget requirement that you're going to need to properly support these vital signs monitors. Okay, that was just a simple example. Talking a bit more about how to get a handle on your rate of usage, you need to document what parts are used when a repair is performed. That is part of the essential service documentation that you should be keeping in your clinical engineering department. This is most easily done, obviously, with an electronic work order system, but it can also be done with paper records. Um, it, this documentation allows you to perform the calculation of a rate of consumption of, of all of the parts that you're using. Once you do that, you can then effectively manage the parts in your inventory and budget for needed parts in the coming year. Some of the recommended spare parts uh, for hospitals with these well challenged vital signs devices as, as recommended by some of the engineers in Northern Ghana, blood pressure cuffs of assorted sizes for adult and large adult, the, um, the two-way hose for the, uh, and the blood pressure cuff connector for the vital signs monitor or for any um, non-invasive blood pressure monitor that you have in your hospital. The lead acid battery that I talked about uh, in the experience in Ghana, the Zeus brand has proven to be more durable than some other brands. This is typically a, a motorcycle battery available from a motorcycle repair shops. There are a variety of different brands available, but as you develop experience, you'll learn as the engineers in Northern Ghana have that some brands are better than others and some of them will fail very early on in their life and others will last quite a long time need a temperature probe if your monitor has temperature monitoring facilities, a battery charger for the batteries that you're using in those monitors, and replacement uh, pulse oximetry finger clip sensors if your monitors have pulse oximetry features. Now some other generic spare parts I'll talk about um, that are of secondary priority but also useful in generic troubleshooting. 
obviously fuses, an assorted fuse set um, will allow you to troubleshoot many devices as a common failure problem is a, a fuse breakage. If you have a vacuum cleaner, you want, might want to replace the filter. Metal oxide resistors for uh, voltage spike uh, pr protection, AC to DC transformers, uh, transistors, P NPN and PNP, and a, a set of assorted values of resistors if you're doing uh, component level troubleshooting, and LED bulbs for um, examination lights or uh, lamps in, in the operating room. Now, um, I'm gonna add the next slide. Maybe Martin can just do a bit of a... Put it, um, just to carry on then with respect to some other common um, tools that you may need in uh, a workshop. Uh, one is, um, uh, this is an example of a cleaning solution. This looks like a hydrogen peroxide um, cleaning solution to be able to disinfect uh, equipment um, if it's been contaminated or you need to clean it prior to going back to the customers. Um, another suggestion is electrical contact cleaner to help improve the conductivity of some components. And the third thing noted here is uh, penetrating lubricant spay, spray uh, to help uh, loosen any um, uh, bound uh, mechanical uh, components. So our last um, slide here then is to how do you argue for your needed space and tools with administration? And we've just put down some suggestions here. And what and, and the intent is, is to show administration the value that you provide to the organization, to the hospital. And how do you how do you demonstrate value? Well, the first suggestion is that if you start to document some of your recent repairs and demonstrate how much money you've received, or sorry, how much money you've saved by repairing that device versus trying to obtain a new one. Clinical engineering, their entire role is to save the hospital money by continuing to repair and maintain equipment. So if you have documented evidence that shows the value that you're providing, that's the one suggestion. The second suggestion is to describe, describe examples of how you repair medical devices on site quickly and how that contributes to uh, improving patient outcomes by being able to provide that equipment um, in a timely, a timely fashion to help you know, uh, contribute to saving a person's life. And the third thing that I, we've suggested here is um, simply to, again, demonstrate the value of continuing to maintain equipment so that it's, it's more reliable, it's at the patient bedside when it's needed, and again, contributes to improved patient outcomes in the hospital. And that's some, some mechanisms to help you demonstrate the value. And John's, I think, unmuted. So maybe John, would you like to contribute? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Okay. So this slide, as you rightly mentioned, um, I am sure most of our engineers have gone to the hospitals as uh, at the time there were no engineers in these hospitals. And uh, before the advent of their going, it means that the hospital would have been engaging the services of either engineers from the national level or engineers outside the area. So administrators will be comparing the advent of their coming to the maintenance they were getting from other engineers. The comparison will be your advent of coming to the, the hospital as an engineer. They will compare your impact against the impact of before your coming. Then they will assess to see whether 
your presence in the hospital as compared to at the time you were not there, whether they have achieved anything or not. That will tell them, that will determine what sort of resources that can be used. You have to argue and show them that your presence in the hospital now, they have achieved more as compared to at the time you were not there. Because when they start comparing your presence in the hospital and finds that, oh, at the time you were not here, you were getting better services compared to the time you are here. That means that your presence there you not know, have a lot of impact as compared to the time you were not there. So to argue for a lot of resources, you really need to do more and document your works. The documentation that you are doing is really going to show that you are working. Because we've been saying that if you do maintenance services in your work environment and you don't document anything, there's no history to show that you are working. You could probably repair 1,000 pieces of equipment in a year. But if you are not able to show by document that this is what I did for the year, this is the worst I did. And they're showing the type of spare parts we have used, you know, show the old ones against the new ones. And then also documenting your, uh, your spending. How much money have you spent throughout the year for maintenance? If you are able to document all these things and record and show that, show it to your management that you are able to work spending this amount of money and then comparing as to the time you were not there because they will compare how much were they spending compared to the time that you are, you are there. If they were spending a lot of money before you coming in, that means that you're coming have saved a lot of money. But before you can show, you have to document all this expenditure. If not, you are not able to argue for resources for your work. So it is very important that you document everything as you work along. Hello? Hello. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I don't know whether you are hearing what I'm saying. Yes, yeah. that was excellent. Thank you, John. That was excellent. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. The connection has been very bad. Yes, yes. But you you came through loud and clear. So Okay. Thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so um it's very important that engineers document the works they do. And you are able to convince your administrators or your authority when you are able to show data. Data is very important. If you are not able to show data of your work, then nobody believes in what you are saying. And then for that matter, they are not able to help you. But we shouldn't also forget that resources are very scarce and everybody is competing to get these resources. Others will also need the same amount of resources to do their work. And if they are able to go to show by, by their works, by data, by information that they are working and showing by clear examples and evidence, then they are able to get resources to support them to work. So I would advocate for our engineers to also stand firm and they indicate to their authority, administrators, indicate to them that the work they are doing worthwhile and they need resources to actually back them to do the work. So it's very important that all the time documentation, documentation is very, very important in the work we do. So for this, I think we will go ahead and in future document everything that we do. But well, I've gone to most hospitals and then you are not able to point at jobs that people have done which is very unfortunate for us. So I will plead again, let's document, let's document and then prove to the hospital administration that we are working through documentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Okay. Okay, so we, we were, just to summarize now what, what we've been talking about in the, in the webinar today, um, we talked about the ideal amount of space and location of the workshop. Uh, recommended workshop layouts, power and furniture requirements, recommended tools, secure storage of tools, recommended spare parts, 
and finally how to argue for the needed space and tools with administration. You need to, um, as John has emphasized, uh, documentation and you need, need to also be a bit of a salesman because a lot of your work as a clinical engineer is invisible to the administrators. So you have to be constantly reminding them of what you're doing because they don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that's the summary of uh, what we've presented. I just wanted to mention now that um, we're gonna open this for discussion. We are uh, going to be offering um, certificates of attendance for people who've attended this workshop. Um, and the way you get that certificate, this is just one of the uh, references we used. Um, the way you get that certificate is to participate in the post webinar survey. And the link to that survey is here. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's not a hot link. You, you're gonna have to write this down, but we're now opening the um, workshop to uh, questions. This is called a certificate of completion out of attendance, sorry. Um, the uh, survey will ask you know, for your uh, feedback on what was the best parts and the worst parts of this uh, webinar. We will be um, also, this rep webinar has been recorded um, and it will be made available uh, through the Ghana Medical Health website. It'll be a YouTube recording, so you can go back and watch this at a later time. If you uh, came in late or if you want to just review some of the topics we've discussed. So um, with that, I will um, thank our participants and, and perhaps um, ask Kelly if she wants to make some comments. Thanks, Bill. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, attending the, our second webinar. We've included the survey link for your evaluation on the survey in the comment section, the chat section here. You can click on it directly to complete that survey. Again, if you fill out your name and email, then we have an attendance record. And if you come, if you attend all of the different webinars, even not in person, but if you like, it doesn't have to be live. If you attend it via watching it on YouTube and then fill out the survey, which is linked to the YouTube um, recording of this, you'll still get that completion uh, attendance checkbox. So at the end of the, the series, the four videos, um, the four webinars, then you can have a certificate of completion, which you can use uh, for work to show that you attended this training program in, in full. If you have any questions about that, please, uh, you can message on the group chat so we can clarify. Thank you, Pa. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah, this is George Boedu. Hello, George. Yeah. Um, good evening to you all. Uh, please, I have a question and uh, also a comment on um, the documentation. The comment I have is that, in fact, it is very important that we document whatever we do. And that is what will sell us as clinical engineers. But most often we do not because um, at times we, we, when we don't have softwares for, for us to use, it becomes studios when we continue doing paperwork all the time. So I want to find out if um, Ghana Medical Help uh, as part of your work in the Northern part of Ghana, if you have some kind of uh, software that you use for this uh, documentation and records keeping of uh, maintenance works. And then the second issue, the second one is a comment, which um, I believe if we, we, we are able to do that, it will also sell our profession, is um, charging for our services. As Bill uh, rightly said, clinical engineering is, is a savings department. But what do we have to show in terms of savings if we, we only talk about the equipment we have prepared without quantifying the cost component of it? You know, in the hospital, 
we have various departments and some of the various departments, especially in Kolebu Teaching Hospital, we have BM, sub BMCs. And every BMC at the end of the year or at the end of the fiscal year, declare their income and expenditure. They declare their profits. But clinical engineering, what do we have to show? We don't have any profit to show that this is how much we have generated to save the hospital. We can only quantify the amount of work we've done, but we can't quantify the cost savings aspect, the how much we have saved. For example, if um, we have a third party um, maintenance team that come to our hospital to service our equipment, at the end of the day, they charge for their services. And the hospital pays. As in-house engineers, we also charge for our services. I think it is time for us to also charge for our services, if not collecting the money physically. We charge for the services and we document it that this is what we did and it cost this man this much. And so we have this kind of amount in our coffers, which the hospital is owing to the department. And if we are able to do that at the end of the year, we can quantify how much we have saved for the hospital in terms of financial value. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, I'm sure Martin and I both have <laughs> some uh, opinions on that, but l let, me, let me just, a little bit of background. What we were, um, Ghana Medical Help does not have a software package at present, but one of the first things we were planning to do um, this April with the on-site visit was um, start a process of, of developing um, an electronic inventory because the basis of um, a work order database is the inventory. So you have to start with the inventory and that was the first step we were going to take in moving towards a, an electronic um, work order documentation system was to develop an um, electronic inventory. That um, has obviously been stalled because of the pandemic. Um, but that would have been the first stage. So planned hopefully for 2021. Um, then the implementation of a, as we call it, a CMMS, a computerized medical, uh, computerized maintenance management system is um, a second step. And again, it is not a magic um, wand. It's not actually gonna save a lot of time there's a great deal of effort involved in simply implementing such a computerized uh, database. Um, and so it's not a process you can just sort of turn on and magically you've um, saved yourself time and created wonderful documentation. So there's a lot of work involved in preparation before you can actually implement that. And so I don't think we're at that stage yet, but it's, it's a goal we're working towards. Um, but it does give you the ability to generate much better documentation. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and then I'll hand it over to Martin to, to, to comment. Uh, one of the ways we justify our, our cost savings in Canada is that whenever new equipment is purchased, we ask for the vendor to provide us a quote on the cost of a service contract. And we use that as a yardstick to demonstrate what, how much money the in-house service is saving uh, by not pr purchasing the, the service contract from the outside vendor. So getting quotations from outside vendors for their service is an important um, piece of data that you can use to uh, demonstrate your cost savings. With that, I'll turn it over to Martin, I'm sure, has other perspectives on this. Over to you, Martin. Um, yeah, just with, re uh, just re-emphasizing, yes, in terms of documentation, the first, yeah, the first step is to develop an inventory system. And it, it, it will, we'll be talking about um, an inventory system and a service uh, recording system. And uh, I think that's, we're going to do that in our next webinar. 
Um, but it could start as simple of ju as just being on paper for a period of time and a, and a simple filing system and documenting um, those repairs where there's been a clear savings, you know, essentially just keeping a, a simple spreadsheet or, or again, it could be just on paper. Those opportunities, or sorry, those examples of where you, you clearly save the organization um, lots of money. So that would be a start. But yes, the longer term goal would be get to an electronic uh, computerized maintenance management system. Um, with respect to the, you know, charging for services, I'm not, I mean, I'm not familiar on, on how Jana's administration is um, set up. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it could be something that, that could be considered. Uh, but you, I think what's more important is as Bill is reflecting is to demonstrate, you know, this is what the vendor will charge for a full service contract, but this is what I, we can do with our in-house and hopefully get the support from the administration uh, to do so. The second thing um, that we work on is we have a, a budget, we actually have a budgeting model um, in our organization, which is 7% of the value of the equipment coming in. So we have an arrangement with the administration so that we have a, a net new piece of technology coming in for a value of, you know, a thousand thousand dollars or say, you know, we would expect um, at least $70 to come our way to take care of the device. Okay. And, and that's our, that was our means to uh, ensure we have adequate support moving forward to take care of the technology, both in labor and parts. And that's, um, I'll just jump in there. Even if a lot of your equipment coming into the hospital is donated, and so no money has changed hands, there, it still has a cost impact on the organization, both in terms of um, staff required to operate the equipment, supplies, consumables for the equipment, and the maintenance costs. And as Martin has mentioned, for any piece of equipment, if the capital cost is known, or you can estimate the capital cost, then it is a widely publicized um, factor, cost factor, that maintenance of a medical device on average is between five and 7% of the capital cost each year. And um, there are publications that we can refer you to uh, to uh, use that justification, but you are generally reducing the cost to the organization because outside service providers, the cost is between 10 and 15% of the capital cost per year to provide support for that equipment. And so uh, typically in-house service is um, around half the cost of, of getting the same service from an outside vendor. Uh, again, because many factors, travel is one of them, but also the profit margin of the service provider is a big component of their cost. Um, thanks, Martin. And thanks, George, for that excellent question. Um, so we are um, coming to the top of the hour. If anyone else would like to raise a question, now is your opportunity or we'll um, close down the webinar and um, hope you can join us for the next one. And in the meantime, ask you to um, fill out the survey and register for the um, certificate of attendance. Hello, Bill. Yes, John. Yes. I wanted to contribute a bit to the, um, the software issue. Please, go ahead. Yeah. So what I can suggest is um, we may not want to, uh, since we don't have any sophisticated, work, uh, what do you call it, documentation, um, templates for now. People can simply use um, Excel sheets to create templates that will be very simple and easy to just document what they are doing. I remember 
um, a few years back, when Marco came down, we created an access template for the engineers in the three northern regions. And uh, some of them use it. And I think they derive a lot of benefit from using that template. And some even added on to uh, some of the field that we created on the access uh, documentation sheet. So I believe if um, the engineers who attend this webinar now, if uh, Sebastian and the rest are on it, they will bear witness to the fact that that template was created using access. And uh, they use it quite a lot. Quite apart from that, just as I said, Excel is a very excellent document. I mean, Excel can be used to document anything that we want to do. It's very important that we get that clear. And uh, so we don't need to dwell on any sophisticated uh, software for now. But we can use this simple, simple, you know, tool that we have in our hands already to get documentation going. Okay, so that, that is the contribution I have for that. Thank you, John. Yes. Okay. Important point to make. Um, uh, Kelly corrects me again. It's a certificate of completion, not of attendance, that we offer if you fill out the survey. So um, please fill out the survey. And um, thank you, Martin, and um, all the participants for uh, attending today. And um, we'll be putting on another webinar in about a month's time. And that one will deal with uh, the, in the issues around um, managing a medical device inventory and how you, the things you need to do to take an accurate inventory and keep it up to date. Anyway, thank you everybody for joining us and we'll sign off for today. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you.